Hello. In today's video, I'd like to provide an example of experimental archaeology, using as a case study an experiment on the function of an unusual pottery vessel type found in the late Neolithic of the Near East. But the main point of the video is to demonstrate some of the features of a good experiment, as well as some features of our own experiment that fall short of an ideal experimental design. In 1942, the Iraqi archaeologist Fuad Safar found that there was late Neolithic occupation at the site of Tal Hasuna in northern Iraq. In the following two years, he and the English archaeologist Seton Lloyd led excavations at this site by a team from the Iraqi Directorate of Antiquities. They documented a stratified sequence of late Neolithic houses along with hearths and ovens, and the site became the type site for the Hasunan culture which has since been documented at a number of sites across northern Iraq and Syria. Among the abundant and diverse pottery found at the site was an unusual tray-like kind of vessel. The bottom surfaces of the trays were either scored deeply or showed many pebble impressions, and there were often also vertical incisions along the interior walls of the vessels. The function of these trays was not at all obvious. Lloyd and Safar coined the term husking tray to describe this type of vessel, with the implication that it may have been used to de-husk wheat or barley. However, as far as I'm aware, no one ever showed how this might work. A competing hypothesis is that the trays were actually griddles for baking flatbreads. The first person to suggest that the husking trays may have been for baking bread appears to have been Mary Voigt. She mentioned this hypothesis in her 1983 publication of the site of Haji Firuz Tepe, a late Neolithic site in northwestern Iran. Even today, one of the ways to make flatbreads in the Middle East is to place a very thin pizza-like layer of dough on a curved metal griddle that's placed over the coals of a fire. Among the Bedouin of Jordan, for example, the resulting very thin bread is called shrak. Although an experiment like the one I'll demonstrate today cannot prove that this second hypothesis is correct, the experiment can serve to determine whether or not the husking trays were suitable for baking bread. Specifically, we'll test the hypothesis that the grooves or pebble impressions improve the tray's efficiency at baking bread, including preventing sticking of the bread. To do this, the experiment should have some controls, which would include keeping the trays that we use in the experiment as consistent as possible in their composition, size, and shape. Except that some should have grooves, some should have pebble impressions, and there should be a control group that has neither of those things. We would want the experimental vessels to be fired to the same temperature and under the same atmospheric conditions. And when baking the bread, we'd want to use nearly identical dough and to randomize the order in which we use the trays during the baking. This last feature of randomization is to compensate for what's called the history effect, which in this case would involve compensating for things like the temperature of the fire that could change over time. Besides the controls, there are also variables in the experimental design. The most important one is that there's variation in the base of the vessels, with some of them being grooved and others having pebble impressions. In this experiment, there was also variation in the composition of the vessels with one group having sand temper alone and the other having sand and chaff temper. This allows us to check whether or not the composition of the temper has any effect on the outcome of the bread. The resulting structure of the experiment looks like this, with a control and two treatment groups with respect to the treatment of the bottom surface of the tray and two tempering types. So now we just have to make the vessels, dry them, fire them, and then use them to bake some bread. In my course on archaeological lab methods at University of Toronto, this Hasunin husking tray experiment is one of the experiments we sometimes pursue. And one of those occasions was during the academic year of 2021-2022. The students began by mixing clay with temper, with some groups using sand alone, and others using a mixture of sand and plant fiber. After it was adequately mixed with water, it needed to be wedged to remove any air bubbles. 
the students rolled out slabs to serve as the base of the vessels. And then began making coils to build up the walls of the vessels. Probably made this wonder. I mean, yeah, but like, ew. Can they be just. I'm not sure. Well, the only NMC. Hey, Mark, will you date? I literally go into a meeting and say I'm interested in this 499 or 498. This you mean? Okay. And that's like, I, I don't know how to broach it. I, I, would, I would send an email for. It's important to ensure that the coils are well joined to each other and to the slab that forms the base. I want to make sure I don't miss any major steps in your construction here. So you're ready to put the vertical groove? Once the walls were complete and well joined, the next step was to create the incisions along the interior of the walls. It's interesting to note that the students varied in their technique. This student made pebble impressions with short jabs with the pebble. And the impressions were made in a series of concentric circles. By contrast, this student used a twisting motion to make the pebble impressions and arranged them in a linear fashion. After slowly drying for several weeks, the trays that survived the drying process without severe cracking were fired in an oxidizing atmosphere, with the temperature ramping up slowly to 600 degrees Celsius. After holding at that temperature for a couple of hours, the kiln slowly cooled off overnight. The result was a low-fired earthenware. Now, one of the things we'll want to do before we conduct the experiment is to document the trays that we're going to use in it. And what we have here are three groups of three husking, so-called husking trays, uh, one of which uh, is a group that has grooves in the bottom, like these ones. Then we have another group of three that has pebble impressions in the bottom, kind of like that. And finally, we have a control group control group consists of trays that have neither of those things in them. So we have three of these also. So what I need to do now is take photographs of all these so we can document what they look like before the experiment. We'll also label them so we can randomly select the order in which we use them during the course of the experiment. Even though the plan was to have husking trays that were as similar to each other as possible, aside from the various treatment groups, the reality is that they vary quite a bit. G1, seen here, is circular in plan view instead of oval and has rather rectangular grooves instead of V-shaped ones. G2 is also quite circular but does have V-shaped grooves. Its base is just a little bit less smooth than that of G1. G3 is a lot less regular in shape and execution than G1 or 2, 
but it does have an oval shape and V-shaped grooves. On the base you can see some imperfect joining and at least one void. The base shows fabric impressions from the fabric on which the slab was rolled out. P1 is also fairly irregular in its form and execution. Its pebble impressions are concentrically arranged and, as already noted, had been executed by a stabbing motion. Its base also shows fabric impressions. P2 is a tray that was actually made by a previous year's class and is used here to replace a tray that did not survive the drying process. It's a little larger than most of the other trays and has a fairly irregular pattern of pebble impressions. There's also a small crack in the rim. On the base you can see that this tray has been used before with linear patterns of soot from the grill. P3 comes quite close to the intended size and oval shape and as already noted its pebble impressions are in somewhat linear arrangement and were executed with a twisting motion. On the bottom we can see that there's an imperfect join between the wall of the vessel and the slab base. Moving to the control group C1 is another replacement tray made by students in a previous class. It's quite circular in plan and fairly large in size. Once again, we can see sooting on the bottom from its previous use. C2 is fairly oval in plan and a little bit irregular in form. Its griddle surface is fairly smooth, but not quite as smooth as C1. The base shows some voids and imperfect joins. C3 is similar in size and shape to real husking trays, except that its plan is a little bit more subrectangular than oval. It's somewhat crudely executed, with a fairly smooth surface on the bottom and a major crack in one wall, while the underside is a little bit rough and irregular. Now that we've documented the trays, we're ready to put them to use. We can't be sure what recipe was used for the dough for Neolithic flatbreads, or even if it was leavened or unleavened, but it seems likely that it would have involved stone ground whole wheat flour. As we didn't have any of that available, we'll compromise by trying to simulate some crude Neolithic flour. For each batch of dough, we started with one cup of modern white flour, added half a cup of whole wheat flour, and then a quarter cup of burgle wheat to give it a coarser texture. We also added a tablespoon of wheat bran, and a tablespoon of wheat germ. Finally, we added a small sprinkle of sea salt. To make an unleavened dough, we then added one cup of cool water. Finally, we knead the dough a little bit and then form it into a ball. At the end, we dusted each ball with a little bit of whole wheat flour so that it wouldn't stick to the plastic bag in which we'd store it. 
Having already made too many compromises on the dough, I wanted to make sure that we could start the fire without using something like a chemical accelerant. Dry moss would be a possibility, but here I decided to use crushed bark. Crushed tree bark makes an excellent fire starter because it has a high surface to mass ratio and it ignites very easily, especially when it's dry. This is more than enough to get our fire started for the experiment. Because Toronto fire codes prohibit the use of an open hearth, we'll have to make another compromise by using a charcoal barbecue as our source of heat. I place some crushed tree bark on a large piece of bark so that it doesn't fall through the grate. Then I place some small dry twigs over the crushed bark. and arrange some pieces of charcoal around the twigs. This is yet another compromise because the only real charcoal you can get in Toronto is mesquite charcoal. And in any case, Neolithic bakers would most likely have used dung fuel for most of their bread baking. Needless to say, my students probably wouldn't have been too keen on eating bread that was baked on a dung fire, even though it actually can be quite tasty. A few pieces of dry kindling round out the fuel because the wood will ignite faster than the charcoal will. Now that the fire is started, we'll add a few more pieces of charcoal and place a water bucket nearby in case of some accident. It takes a while for the coals to get sufficiently hot, and in retrospect, we probably should have used a lot more charcoal from the beginning and made sure we had an extremely hot fire. We cast a die to decide the order in which we'd use the baking trays. Four, we said, was for Pebble uh, and Press. Crew. No, one and two is Pebble and Press, three and four was, was uh, sorry, one and two was Groove, three and four was Pebble and Press. So we're going to use Pebble and Press. Now, which one, roll again and see whether, whether we get a one or two or a three? We might have to do, oh, I don't know, that'll, four, five. Five, okay. Uh, well, the easiest I'll thing just, is just roll to you get a one, yeah. two, or a three. <laughs> Okay, we got three. So that means we want uh, P3. In the modern Middle East, people like Bedouin often place three pebbles in the fire to serve as a sort of tripod to support a cooking pot. We imitated that practice here, but in retrospect, it probably wasn't necessary, as these flat bottom trays could just as easily have sat on the coals themselves. Okay, so why don't you try doing something like that with it to make it a little bit flat? You could even stretch it a bit, kind of like pizza. Yeah, yeah, I get the gluten activated. That's right. You're doing great. You're doing great. <laughs> 
And most of, most of the trays are a little bit oval in shape, so we can make it a little bit elongated. What are we thinking for soundtrack? How are we going to open up the sound button? <laughs> maybe maybe you can uh, make some music for it. Deal. Sorry, I don't want to uh, ruin your shot. For that epic. <laughs> Alright, how do we feel about that? Uh, Looks pretty good. So, remember, uh, I'm just going to turn this over towards the uh, barbecue the, and. Is it hot enough, you you want to just flop it on? Uh, perfect fit. Perfect. There we go. How long would you reckon that's going to take? I'm not sure. Normally it would only take a couple of minutes, but I don't think it's oh, hot yeah. enough. No, I Although the first trial did result in a baked loaf, it took at least 10 minutes and was still undercooked. I would argue it's still a little too hot. It's quite hot. Here you go. Oh, that's quite hot. It looks like bread. I mean, that's pretty cool. Let's just say if I were to post it. was so close. Because the article is Honestly, it's like 80% half cooked. 80%. 80%. It's quite hot. I can tell them. So it's still Consequently, we added more charcoal to the fire and tried to get a hotter fire. Our random selection for the second trial was C1 from the control group. We left it to heat up on the coals for about 10 minutes before putting any dough on it. This student pressed out the dough on a flat board rather than making a patty in her hands. You can, you can also hang it so it'll stretch. So it's kind of like kind of like do you want to try Okay. Let me just, yeah, just can you flop it on? All right. Yeah, you can decorate it when you're like Canadian or whatever. Yeah. Nice. Are we going to do a demo uh, of wow. uh, the very sharp old culture domicile? A little bit big for the size of the site. Yeah, that's what she is. I like that. Yeah, I can see it. It looks really good. Like, wait, it's too hard. You don't have to only a perfect day for you. The next random selection was G3 with grooves in the bottom. At this point, we started preheating the next tray to be used because it was taking too long to get them hot enough for use. That's good. Yeah, I think it's probably done. And then flop the other one down. Okay. Good job. Looks good. You'll notice here that we'd added more charcoal and we began to fan the fire to try to get it hotter. Go for it. They're just, they're just like, yeah. There you go. Unceremonious right now. Okay. Good. <laughs> the fire's popping. Oh my god, wait, I want like the thick fire. Sir, you just missed it. 
So, what did we learn from all this? We actually did learn something about our main hypothesis, but we also learned something about flaws in our experimental design. None of the bread stuck to the trays, and all of the trays seemed to perform reasonably well to bake flatbreads. On its face, this would seem to suggest that the grooves and pebble impressions made no difference with respect to the tray's suitability for baking bread, and specifically with respect to the likelihood of the bread sticking. I should emphasize here that we didn't use any oil on the surface of the pans. However, there are some other observations we were able to make. On our first two trials, the coals weren't anywhere near hot enough, the trays themselves were probably not hot enough, and the loaves took a long time to bake and never did bake thoroughly. Partway through the experiment, we started to preheat the trays by putting the next tray alongside the one being used. And although we had controlled for the composition of the dough, we didn't control for its thickness, and the first couple of loaves were generally thicker than the later ones. Among the controls that worked fairly well were the pretty consistent composition of the fabric with two types of tempering, a control group without grooves or pebble impressions, and identical firing conditions in the kiln. Randomizing the order of the use of trays also compensated for the history effect and especially for the fact that the temperature of the fire changed over time. However, there were other things that we didn't control very well. Ideally, the size and shape of the trays should have been really consistent apart from whether or not they were pebble impressed, grooved, or plain. In reality, they varied quite a bit. And while our dough composition was consistent, it probably didn't mimic Neolithic dough very well at all. Aside from the fact that we didn't use stone ground wheat, we have no idea what the water content should have been, or even whether Hasunan people would have used leaven or unleavened dough. In addition, we didn't control for baking times, the fuel we used was not correct, and the temperature of the hearth changed quite a lot during the experiment, probably more than our randomization could really control for. In addition, we only began preheating the trays part way through the experiment. So, while our preliminary conclusion is that the pebble impressions and grooves made no difference to the functionality of the trays for baking, we can't have a high level of confidence in these conclusions, because it's possible that they might have made a difference had we used leavened dough or dough with a higher water content. If we were to repeat the experiment, it would be better to preheat the trays throughout the experiment, control for the size and thickness of the dough, and use both leavened and unleavened dough, to control the number of minutes that we bake each loaf, and probably also to use thermocouples to track the temperature of the fire over the course of the experiment. Well, my students and I had fun with that experiment, and although we had to take a few shortcuts, partly uh, because of the fact that we're doing it in Toronto, where there are health and safety regulations having to do with open flames and in open spaces, and also because of the fact we have to do this as part of a class, um, I hope it helped to demonstrate at least some of the features of a proper experimental design, including the use of randomization to control for factors like history. If you'd like to learn more about experimental design in archaeology, you can check out Chapter 6 of my book, The Archaeologist's Laboratory, available from Springer, as well as the references I cite there. I'll also place some references at the end of this video and in the comments area down below. Thank you, and stay safe. Oh, okay. I think yeah. the entire, like, left oh,